Okay, so uh, um, welcome. Uh, this is like I said a minute ago. This is my my first uh, experience with Freaknik, so I'm glad to be here. I hope you guys enjoy this. Um, it started as a random idea, and then thanks to a friend encouraging me, it has now become a presentation. So, provided I don't throw up in the next five minutes, it should be a good day. All right. So, good afternoon. Uh, my name's James. Um, I've been uh, in the computer industry for a while now. I don't like to think about it that way because when I look out, I when I see everybody, they're all my age. So I just assume we've all been in the industry the same amount of time. And now where I work, I found out I'm one of the old guys and that's starting to kind of set in. Um, so since you guys don't know me, I figure I might as well tell you a little bit about myself, how I actually came to be standing in front of you guys. Um, it all started back in 1984, roughly. Uh, you know, like I said, getting older, my memory's starting to go. Um, my dad brought home an Apple IIe. Um, it actually, he'd actually sprung for the extra 64K of RAM, so it was a glorious machine. And I played video games on that thing pretty much until it broke, uh, which is surprisingly my senior year of high school. Uh, it lasted a long time. Um, then when I actually got into the industry, I became a sysadmin. Uh, anybody out here sysadmins, network administrators? Awesome. I've been one, been one in been one. the past. All right, well, I'll, I'll buy you a shot later if you want one, because. It, that's not an easy job. All right, okay, we have more now. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, nobody likes to admit it. Um, after that, I began my descent into Lovecraftian madness by joining the dark side and starting to write code. Uh, started with Perl, so anybody wants to do regex, we can get together after this. Um, still, still is my favorite language. Um, and then, this is probably the last you'll hear about the company that I work for. I went to Land Cup in 2014, and what I had learned was everything that I had done up to that point was just kind of a warm up for what. I really should have been doing the entire time, which is uh, kind of an extension of really building cool stuff, but focusing more on the security side of things, which is kind of how I got here. So this talk really is about all of David Lightman's hijinks and adventures in the movie War Games and how that applies to your life. Man, nobody, okay, all right. Actually, we're gonna talk about something a little bit different. Um, so these are kind of the objectives that I wanna to cover today. Uh, start with an outsider's perspective. When I actually wrote this, I, I was more of an outsider. I really had not done much with security. I was it's one of those people who kind of look in and uh, see what everybody else does. And then we'll kind of cover the basics uh, for anybody who may not know what you know capture the flag and war games are. And then this is where the talk is a little bit different. Um, Going to look at how traditional methods can fail when you're trying to you pick up a new skill, whether it's you know becoming a security expert, learning about web pen testing, anything. Um, and then how. Potentially, games can change some of that learning. And then, hopefully, if you guys are still with me by that point, uh, how we can have better security overall uh, through gaming. Uh, and then, so, if you guys are still with me after that, how can you convince your friends to play? And that's what the infection vector is about. I, I wish it was more of a, you know, how to infect other machines and then get other people to play CTFs to unlock them. Haven't quite worked that out. I, I am doing a side project on that. Um, and then finally, bring it all together. Uh, so hopefully it all makes sense, and then hopefully questions, lots of questions, lots of discussions. Feel free to interrupt me at any time if you, if you think you know if I lose you. Okay, so like I said, given my background, obviously I didn't jump into the industry as a security person. Um, what I didn't realize is that, you know you think when you're on the outside of the security industry that there's all this hidden knowledge. Uh, what I didn't realize is that being on the outside and trying to kind of cross that that threshold, uh, it gave me a very unique perspective. So um, everybody out here, uh, who actually does, who gets paid to do security for a living? I guess that's the way I should ask that question. Or you know, anything, it could be you know, hardening systems, whatever. Okay, I got a, got a couple of brave volunteers out there. Um, so you guys who actually do this or, or see people who do this on a daily basis, you may not realize um, this is, this is kind of how security professionals are seen by the uninitiated. Uh, you know, wilders of black magic, you know, the hidden knowledge up in the towers, like causing things to crash and, you know, wreaking havoc on, you know, grids everywhere in the world. And, you know, that's, that's kind of how people are seen. Uh, the, the truth, as with all things, is not quite as glamorous, uh, although I really wish I had that cool hat that guy had. So where, where my adventure began and kind of, like I said, why I'm here. Uh, how many of you guys are on Reddit? I'm guessing everybody. Okay. Um, I stumbled across this. Obviously, you could tell I was trying to learn security by the actual subreddit, How to Hack. It was a pretty interesting place. And so the, the title of the, the post was Extracting a Pass from a Hex Dump File. And I, in my haste, glossed over the last part of that, which is overthewire.org problem 13. 
So I thought, oh, that'd be a pretty cool skill to pick up. How can I extract things? I, you know, I can read hex, or you know, roughly read hex. And so this Reddit post sent me down a rabbit hole. Uh, it was a very good rabbit hole. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with Joseph Campbell and the hero's myth, uh, the, you know, this is the stage that is called crossing the threshold. So I didn't realize that I was actually going to be learning new skills or actually picking up new things. I just found something that was really cool and wanted to see what it was like. So this particular problem is part of the Bandit series of Over the Wire, which I'll get into a little more detail if you guys don't know about that. It's a they're an awesome site. Um, and after 26 levels, this is how I felt. I was like, I've done it. I am now a hacker, and I can go out and conquer the world. Um, not quite, but you know, I was well on my way. So, and, and the most important thing was is that I was hooked. I had found a new way to play games, and uh, I wanted more. Also. Given that I wasn't in security, I figured, and you know, given that I had never worked for a security company, I was like, I am probably the last person on earth to discover this, and you know, therefore I'll not tell anybody about it. So, as it turned out, when I actually finally did talk about it with everybody at work the very next day, no one had any clue what I was talking about except for a couple of the active security people that work at our company, like real security people on the, the other side. Um, a lot of us are engineers. Um, we have a more than uh, probably healthy obsession with security, but we, we don't really do this actual security pen testing and things like of that nature. Um, so it turns out that really nobody knew about this. So <laughs> the, the more that I kept thinking about, the more I kept playing, the more that I kept realizing these patterns were emerging and things that I would think about when I was writing my own code or hardening the Linux platforms that I was working on, I realized there might be something a little bit more to it. So you guys will, uh, Humor me. We'll just kind of, you know, give an overview about what, what I'm talking about when I say capture the flag and and war games. So, you know, capture the flag. Uh, everybody's probably played at least one of the styles if you've actually tried them. Uh, they're they're basically three different styles. There's the Jeopardy style, attack defense, and then kind of a hybrid mix of those two. Um, Jeopardy styles. You can cover anything. It could be web vulnerabilities. It could be crypto reverse engineering. Uh, it could be just general trivia. I've seen a lot of trivia ones. Uh, usually, you want to have a team. Um, because it gives you a way to diversify your skill and get more points. Uh, points are gained by completing tasks. Usually there are, you can just go to any task, they get harder and they have higher points. Sometimes you have to unlock lower tasks to get to the next higher task. Um, famous example of this is any one of the DEF CON CTF calls, if you guys have, uh, you know, know of those. Um, there are several actually really good ones you can do online, uh, they pop up. Um, and then uh, the next style is attack defense, which is actually the kind of thing that's going on right now with the network king of the hill. You have machines, you try to attack them um, and gain vulnerabilities, and, and you get points for doing that. Uh, the defense side comes in when you actually have owned a machine, you try to defend it from other people coming in and owning it from you, you gain more points the longer you can hold on to it. Um, actually, this is this, the type, the, the Attack defense is the historically the first kind of CTF there was. That was actually the first one that came up, and then the new ones have started coming after that. Um, let's see. Okay, so this leads us to war games. Uh, obviously, like I said, I had to have a couple of references to the movie. Um, it's a it's a per, usually a persistent style of CTF, so it really doesn't change much uh, from the so more of the Jeopardy style, except that. You have different logins for different levels. It's usually hosted online. Although I know with the uh, over the wire guys, they can uh, you can download ISOs and actually install them locally if you don't trust going into their their SSH uh, SSH and into their machines. So it's almost always a single player. Whereas you know usually with the other CTFs you can have teams. Uh, so it's really just you and the computer. Um, let's see. <laughs> usually the game starts by you're given a password. You're given a login to the first level. You work through the levels get more difficult, like any good game, and uh, there are a lot of good services out there that offer these for free over the wire. Um, actually, if you're more interested in reverse engineering or learning how to, to find uh, programming vulnerabilities, smashthestack.org is a great one. Uh, and if anybody wants to find out more about those, I can tell you more about them afterwards. Okay, so you guys will hold with me while I make a brief detour uh, just for something really cool. Um, so the Vegas experiment, this was, you know, like I said, I'm due to this. I begged, borrowed, and stole my way to go to Hacker Summer Camp the, this year. It was a very cool experience. Uh, but, you know, not knowing anybody in the industry, wanting to meet some new people, I said, well, what's the best way that I can do that? I know. I like tiki drinks uh, and basic tiki culture, and I like CTFs. So I'm going to build a portable CTF machine that's just got a random wireless access point. I'm going to walk around in Vegas with my backpack the entire time. Uh, found out afterwards that apparently your backpack can catch on fire. Luckily that did not happen to me, but there is a very funny story there. 
Um, and I, I thought, hey, if people connect, the actual final challenge of it was come find me, and if you found me, um, you know, I was going to give you the way to get to, uh, you know, tell you where we're going to meet, the day we're going to meet at Frankie Steaky Room, uh, another great place in Vegas, and I'd buy you a drink just for having played the thing. Pretty good way to get to know people. So when you're obsessed with CTF and Tiki, you end up going on Amazon and spending a little bit of money to kind of uh, build, uh, you know, Raspberry Pi Model 2, the Zebra case by C4 Labs. If you have a Raspberry Pi, those guys build some of the best cases I've ever seen. Um, you know, micro SD card, and then my favorite tool now is the Alpha AWUS 036NH. Um, and then uh, if you want a battery pack that will last without recharging for two days, uh, that guy on the right, um, I will, I'll post the list of all these things. Anyway, so I'm armed with this, I walk around, and because it's DEF CON and because it's Black Hat and all those things, and everybody's running around, they've got their own agendas, no one played the game. I had like three logins, uh, just logins to the wireless, and that was it. They, they went, they got redirected to the site, and then they logged off. Um, so, but I had a lot of fun. I learned a lot of things from it. So, uh, not, not really a bad, a bad investment. Um, so, once again, what does that have to do with? Oh, okay, we got cut off there. Okay, what does this have to do with how this can make you better, or how it can make other people better at security? Well. I don't think had I ever played, had I not played the first CTF back when I found that Reddit puzzle, that I would have actually had, you know, the guts to build, try to build my own, and uh, then let people play it. Uh, it was only through exposure and kind of getting running into walls and learning new things and, you know, and doing that. But it's not an easy road. In fact, I think the most common question we hear is, how do you hack? You know, so there's a subreddit named that, so it's pretty good. Uh, so let's look at some traditional methods uh, of how you would start out becoming an expert at something, or even just beginning. Um, until my daughter was born, I read pretty much every free minute I had. Uh, usually there was a book in my hand, a Kindle, something. I was reading every minute. So when I started out trying to learn more about security, I went out and bought a stack of books. And then I realized, wait, I don't even know if these books are good. They just had really flashy covers and titles. Um, you know, who are the experts? Do I even, you know, are these guys even good at what they do? Uh, and even more important, am I even asking the right question for what I want to learn? So I was like, okay, well, maybe I, maybe I should maybe I should put these in my wish list and not buy them. All right, so I'll hit Google. Um, you know, jumped on Reddit, signed up for a couple of things, found a lot of security feeds, found podcasts. You know, at the end of the day, I was like subscribed to Bug Tracks. You know, Rada Security, Full Disclosure, Secure Coding, Shania on Security, the Defensive Security Podcast, Down the Security Rabbit Hole, and the Social Engineer Podcast. So I've got all this data coming in. And I still have no idea what to do with it. You know, I'm learning new things. There's lots of information there. These words in my head. Um, so I was like, all right. Well, you know, I work for a company. They like to train people. That's cool. So I was like, okay, let me go find some training. So I started looking, and then I had the same problem. Wait, is this good training? That training cost how much? Well, if it is good training, and I want my company to send me to it again. I probably should make sure it's good before I go to it and get them to spend this money because companies really don't like it when you waste money and then they don't send you back to things. So um, now I'm kind of back at the thing, okay, well, one, how do I know what training I need? So I sat back and I thought to myself, well, what if I could ask an expert? So does, does everybody know who this guy is? Um, yeah. Okay, so you know, Bruce Schneier, really good at cryptography, really smart dude. Um, and then I realized, Wait, I've, I've read one of his books. So back when I was a freshman in college, I read Applied Cryptography. And it was really dense. And I got about a third of the way through it, and then I put it down and said, I'm not a mathematician. Uh, after I got done with college, when I was a senior, I picked it up again, and I said, all right, this time, I'm going to get through it. I've had you know, linear algebra. I've had all kinds of math. I'm, I got math. Still didn't finish it. Uh, understood a little bit more, but didn't finish it. So even if I could like sit down and talk with Bruce, you know, talk with him, have, have like an hour of his time to kind of just pick his brain. Probably about 10 minutes into that conversation, he's gonna be up here and I'm still gonna be down here. And it's really not his fault, it's not my fault, it's just we're not at the same level. So it's very hard to kind of pick something up from an expert. So this leads me to mo you know the main purpose of my talk. Why games? So you guys are trying to worry about that connection. You know, traditional learning methods can fail, but we all like playing games. I mean, if you guys walked in a little bit earlier, I was putting a Nintendo 3DS back into my bag, you know, from my pocket where I've been walking around playing it pretty much this entire day. Um, so 
how can games help us? So the, the quote here is, uh, since this is part of his cutoff, it says, when you strip away the genre differences and the technological complexities, all games share four defining traits. A goal, rules, a feedback system, and voluntary participation. Uh, this is written by, or yeah, this is written by Jay McGonigal. Um, she wrote a book called Reality is Broken, Why Games Make Us Better and How They Can Change the World. So at the point where she said how games can make, or why games can make us better, my thought was maybe I haven't wasted my life playing video games. <laughs> So, I also found out she'd done a TED talk, and this is Jane McGonigal. Um, so any of you guys who are huge gamers out there, you have not wasted your life. There are a lot of great skills that you can pick up from this. Um, I was very happy to find this out. So let's focus on what she was talking about. So these are really the four defining traits that she listed. A goal, rules, a feedback system, and voluntary participation. And you may be thinking to yourself, okay, I get that, that sounds awesome for games, but how does that help us? Well. The reason why CTFs are amazing, and the reason why war games are amazing, is because they have goals. There's a clear objective. Sometimes you even get instructions. You know, you might get a little bit of hints, like you know, these utilities may be helpful, things like that. Um, and the fact that there's a solution gives you a lot of power because it means you're not wasting your time. And I know that the previous talk about the web app, web app, you know, um, hacking. You you can attack a system, and luckily because it was written by humans. Uh, there's probably going to be a vulnerability, but you don't know that. And then if you take a really big system like Linux, like just, hey, I've got a Linux machine. I know it's a Linux machine. I don't know what services are running on it. I don't know what versions there are. I mean, you have a big space to try to get into, but with war games and CTF, it's very small. It's like, hey, here's this little snippet of code. Find the vulnerability in it. Or, you know, here, here's this, uh, you know, crypto puzzle. Solve it. Uh, the goal is achievable, and that's, that's another great thing because it means there is a solution to it, and you can find it. Now, I know um, we don't really like rules uh, pretty much in our group, but in this case, rules are great because rules give us a bounding box. They make that Linux box one service or one web page. You know, they give us this playground, this sandbox to kind of focus in. Um, they also, the rules can give us a tool to find the solution because when you start eliminating the things that the rules are trying to keep you away from in this context, you've then eliminated all of these paths that are never going to work. And if, because it is a game, the rules protect us from cheaters. Uh, sometimes that's from us, and it helps us to be honest, uh, which is actually where we learn. Um, and finally, the rules will actually help us move towards our goal. Our, our goal. <laughs> goal. Yeah. Uh, move towards our goal. And the reason why is because when you start trying to go against the rules, you're actually moving away from the direction that the creator wanted you to go, which is what's going to teach you the skills in the, la in the, the, the first place. Okay, so feedback system. Uh, Anybody in here remember the first time you had like a joystick that had force feedback thing when it vibrated when something happened? Uh, it was a very instantaneous thing, and uh, that, that's been built into games since the beginning. You know, I make a move, let's say in chess, I make a move, someone steals a piece, I realize I made a very bad move, that's instant feedback. Uh, and that feedback is great, uh, because if you think you found that solution and you submit a flag and the computer usually gives you a very snarky reply that you haven't found the flag, well, you realized you were wrong. Uh, you don't have to wait around. You don't have to think is this a vulnerability. You don't have to try to like puzzle through it or you know verify it. You find out instantaneously. And this is great because the faster the feedback cycle, the faster you can adapt and learn and move on and find the solution. Uh, this is actually great for keeping us entertained, which is what makes games great at learning. Um, and then voluntary participation. That's usually how it ends up when I play really tough games, especially nowadays, uh, or when I play online because I'm not very good at first-person shooters anymore. Um, but when you think about it, no one's made you play this game. You did it to yourself. And I think that bears repeating. You, you did this to yourself, and you continue to do it to yourself. You jump off the cliff and die trying to make, you know, trying to make a grab at last minute, guess what? You're going to do it a thousand more times before you figure it out and before you realize you can get better. But, but you will get better. And usually it's very addictive. You want to get the flag. You can't let this solution go. I'm going to sit here for another eight hours and puzzle through it and then figure it out. And, and you could quit, but you probably won't. Uh, and that's what makes it awesome, because it keeps you going. So uh, at least in the context of CTF and war games, I think there's a fifth thing that, that Jay McGonigal missed. Uh, and, and this may actually be in general for all games. You actually have a support structure. There are people there that will help you. They won't give you the answer, but you, know, you can go on IRC. Um, uh, some of you guys are using Slack all the time. IRC is the much cooler, older version of it. Um, and 
when you get stuck, there's always somebody there. There may even be somebody you're, you know, you may be looking at something with web that you've never looked at. And there may be somebody you know that does web stuff all the time. I mean, it could not even be from a vulnerability standpoint. They just, they work on web applications. You can go talk to those people. So you have this built-in support structure that can help you get better. Okay, so kind of talked about CTFs. Kind of showed you guys my example of how this has made me better and kind of explain what games are and why they can help us to learn things. So that's my theory, that CTFs are games that we can introduce either to ourselves or to people who are not security people. And we can make everyone better at security, whether it's application security or network security. We can get people to see these things faster. We can get them to kind of have it in their subconscious because they have played these games. So we could send them to training. We could yell at them more. We could do a lot of other things, but I think if we just subtly introduce them to games that actually teach them these things, it'll be a lot easier when we actually do have to put a policy in place or we do have to talk to them about something else. So how do we do this? Well, first, we have to fix their perspective. They're, they're, like, as an engineer, my first goal is to finish a feature. That's what I've got a product person yelling at me about. So that's what they want me to do. So I'm like, I just gotta get this thing to where it works, where it works, where it works, and then somebody comes along and says, look, you've written it, you've introduced this vulnerability. Well, that, that's not really, okay, sure, how do I fix it? Um, the more that I play these things, the more I start seeing these vulnerabilities as I'm writing the code, or as I'm running it, and I start thinking about how can I break this? Like, I wonder what happens if I put this here. Um, and that, that, was, that was basically, you know, you know, the world hadn't changed, I had changed. My, my way of looking at the world had changed your pattern recognition gets a lot faster because you're exposed to things that are, you know, usually in the top 10 vulnerabilities. They're usually the key things that people are seeing. They're slightly easier versions than actual real world examples, but they are similar enough that you begin to catch these things, whether it's subconsciously and you begin to write things differently. Um, if I look at my code from six months ago before I started doing this uh, and now, or before I really started kind of getting obsessed with this and then now, uh, it's, a lot, it's a lot different. Um, Finally, at least for system admins and software engineers, we start realizing that we need to own the things that we're writing. We need to actually be more aware of our security. Um, Pitcher says, you know, it's, it's hard work, but you know, we, we really, none of us got into this industry because it was easy. Uh, we we kind of like the challenge. We, we like when things get difficult. We like when we're out of our comfort zones. Um, so this just helps us kind of convince people that this is part of, you know, something they need to do. All right, so I guess this leads us to the last question of, okay, I, you, since you guys are in the room, I'm guessing you're still with me. I hope you are. Um, you are convinced that at least there may be something of a theory here. You may want to find out how can I actually introduce people to a CTF. Like, all right, I got, I got three guys who might want to play at work. Or, you know, I got a couple of friends that may want to play. How do I get them into this? Um, are there any tabletop fans in the, in the room? In the web series from Geek and Sundry or they play tabletop games? Great, great show. Um, at one point, Will Wheaton mentioned infection vectors. Uh, his was Ticket to Ride, and that's how he got basically everybody in his family playing board games. CTFs are our infection vectors for all the people we work with. So <laughs> my parents will actually be proud because this is the first time I put my psychology degree to work. So I told them it was not a waste. They did not believe me. Um, so why are these an infection vector? All right, so thanks to my daughter for playing along. It only took about 20 minutes to get that photo. but. If you guys can do what she's doing, and I promise there's no surprises, uh, just close your eyes for a second. And what I want you to do is I want you to think back to the very first game you played, or the very first game you really remember loving. It could be a board game, a card game, video game. Just remember all of the things that kept you playing. Remember all the details, you know, there are probably songs that you can still hear from the, the soundtrack, um, or sounds that you can hear that will instantly remind you of that game and instantly remind you of that feeling. Okay. Open your eyes. That's what CTFs will do for everybody else. The first time that someone cracks the, gets the flag for a CTF, you feel like you could just go out and conquer the world. It's, it, it really is not, not rocket science. It's that exact same, it's the endorphin rush, it's the, it's the holy crap, I figured this out. It's the realization that all of those skills that you have, I mean, all the over the wire stuff in Bandit, if you've ever played around on a Linux box, you can get through all 26 levels. There's no magic about it. It's just learning to use the tools in a slightly different way. And that's 
the biggest jump that you can help them make is they don't they don't need new training they just need to understand that all the things they've been doing their entire career they just need to extend it or look at the problem a different way and this makes that gap happen and also if you send somebody to training or you talk to them about something you want them to learn something new there's this instant fear where they think to themselves hey uh, yeah you, shouldn't I have already known this or or you know what if I what if I can't get it well it's just a game if you don't get it who cares go about your rest of your life um, you can suck at games and no one cares. Your friends may make fun of you, but that's between you and your friends. Um, and it, since it is a game, you get better over time. Uh, you know, the first time that we probably play any game, you're terrible at it, and then you move on. Uh, you keep getting better. So this lowers the threshold um, that usually keeps most people from asking the question of, well, how do I do this? Because they think they should have known it, especially, like for me, when I've been in the industry for 10 plus years, and that's what I, you know, I, I can't, I'm like, well, maybe I should have already known this stuff. Uh, finally, it's fun. You, you start playing, you get curious, you play through the first level, you know, like any game, you get to the end, and then there's another level after that. And so you keep playing. Um, and then also, because this is a game and these are on systems that people have set up for this thing, uh, you're not breaking the law, and it tends to up people's wanting to play things when the police are not going to bust down the doors and arrest them. Okay. So, thank you for sticking with me. This is, the, uh, this is where I try to bring it all together and hopefully you guys will either agree with me or we'll have a great discussion in about five minutes. Um, gaming in general might be able to save the world. I, I kind of believe that. This is why I still play a lot of games. Um, CTF and war games, I think, have the power to make us all more security conscious, especially people who are not security professionals or are not security minded. Uh, and in the worst case, uh, since it is you know, around the 20th anniversary, we could all hack the Gibson and get a handle. <laughs> so, let's do that. All right, uh, then I'll open up to questions. Uh, and uh, please, uh, feel free to ask anything, even if it's just you know, saying you don't agree, we can start there. What are, is there a list out there of sites that have, you know, access, like you mentioned, over the wire yeah. and those, but is there like a, a list that we can go to to be sure we sort of catch everything? Yeah, so the, the question was, is there a list? Yeah, so the place where I started was was Over the Wire. Uh, a friend of mine then recommended uh, Smash the Stack. Uh, both of those are great sites, and they, they use a, a point system called, um, it's either WeChall or WeCall, I've like read things, can't pronounce things. Um, and that actually has a list of, of all the other war games. Um, and so it's pretty easy to find off of the, the Over the Wire. Um, the actually, one of the nice things about Smash the Stack is the very first levels of it start with just Python scripts. So you can see the source code, and then you execute it to get it to spit out the answer. Uh, and that, that was really cool, because you know, reverse engineering, the first thing you see is either Ida Pro or uh, you know, Hopper, and all you see is assembly, and you think to yourself, well, I'm done. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's, a really, that's a really nice way to get into it. And, and yeah, that's a, you know, I can send out my favorites. Uh, Bandit is a great place to start if you're a Linux, uh, if you like Linux. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple more. There's actually a crypto one called, uh, I think, Kryptonite. <laughs> So yeah, they, the war game uh, over the wire has like uh, six or eight puzzles, and Smash the Stack has like uh, I think about as many. And then they, there are a multitude you can of link, sites. Link off of them, find yeah. the links off of them. And then if you if you do a search for like online capture the flags, there you know universities will have events, and it's open to anybody. Uh, those are great ways to get started because they're usually Jeopardy style. And so if you're like, okay, this weekend I'm going to take 12 hours, and I'm just going to do the crypto challenges, sure, or I'm just going to do these kind of challenges. That's another great way to get started. Anybody else? Next one. And if you guys you know, come find me, I'll be here uh, the rest of the conference. If you, something pops in your head, just let me know. And uh, if you want to, you know, ping me. That's who I am. Uh, email and Twitter. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.